Trust in politics is broken. So can we get UK politics working again? That was the last time we were happy. 2012. I'm Beth Rigby, Sky's political editor. Join me every week with Labour's Jess Phillips and Conservative peer Ruth Davidson for some electoral dysfunction. This idea of nuance has completely left politics. Yeah. Together, we'll focus on the policies that could deliver political satisfaction. Follow electoral dysfunction wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Samuels with the Sky News Daily. Good to have your company. Uh, We've all been following, haven't we, the post office IT scandal over recent weeks and months, especially, I think, since that TV drama came out. Well, the last three days have been absolutely explosive because the former post office boss, Porna Venels, has been giving evidence to the inquiry into the wrongful convictions of all those sub-postmasters. What's more is that the Post Office Offences Bill will finally receive royal assent. Now, that means hundreds of wrongly accused post office workers will get their names cleared and their convictions quashed after battling for so many, many years. Well, Paula Vennels did become quite emotional today while she was being questioned and she took a while to regain her composure under some very tough grilling. You failed, didn't you? You failed to get into this on your account. You failed to ask the right questions. You couldn't be bothered, could you, Miss Vennels? The risk was too great. Looking under that rock, you're going to find a problem. It's going to devastate the post office, ruin it. You couldn't let that happen, could you, Ms. Fennels? I worked as hard as I possibly could to deliver the best post office for the UK. What I failed to do, and I have made this clear previously, is I did not recognise the, and it's been discussed within, across the inquiry, the imbalance of power between the institution and the individual, and I let these people down. Now, I haven't forgotten that there is a general election on the way. We're going to talk all about that with our political correspondent, Rob Powell, in a few minutes. So hang on for that. But first, let's continue with the post office inquiry. Paul Kelso has been following events for us. Uh, Good to see you, Paul. So tell us what your key takeaways are from today's evidence. Yeah, I mean, this is day three uh, of evidence. And on the first two days, she face some pretty close and uh, inquisitorial questioning from the counsel for the inquiry. Today, it was the turn of the lawyers for the sub-postmasters, and it felt a little to me like the suppressed fury, anger and outrage of 15 years or more of injustice uh, of the sub-postmasters was being channeled, particularly through the first two barristers we heard from, big baritones uh, who boomed out some really tough questions uh, and um, at one point reduced uh, Paula Venels to tears. That suggests it was their doing. It was actually her response to the response in the room from sub postmasters uh, to her her answers. So it was quite emotional and charged in the room. She was being accused directly of a cover-up. She was told her answers were humbug. She was told at every point she took the wrong fork in the road. You exercise power without a thought for the consequences. At one point, well, this is a woman who is an ordained priest. She was told she uh, preached compassion, but didn't practice it. So it was highly charged, hostile, I would say, both in questioning and in the response of the uh, audience in the room. But there was also some damaging substance in there too. So all in all, I would say the hardest morning of a pretty tough two and a half days already. Yeah, I think there were even shouts, weren't there, at one stage from the, from, from the public gallery? Yes, there were. Um, she was talking about process by which new contracts, quite technical, this, uh, were awarded. Before she was chief executive, she was uh, managing director and head of something called network operations, which effectively meant all the post offices around the country, 25,000 odd. Uh, and she introduced new contracts, which were, I think everybody accepts, were pay too little, were pretty iniquitous. They included potentially a clause that sub post offices were liable for every penny that was short in the accounts, which of course became ruinous when the accounting system started making up shortfalls because of errors. And she said these contracts at one point were optional and someone in the uh, audience 
shouted at her angrily. You know, they were compulsory. They were compulsory. Clearly, it's an issue when you talk to sub-postmasters. The detail of this stuff was really divisive and very, very difficult for them. He was immediately quietened down. Uh, the chair of the inquiry is not here today. He's, he's remotely presiding, but has been very clear just as he stopped the sub-postmasters applauding Alan Bates at the end of his evidence. He had today in mind, these days in mind, he didn't want booing and barracking to uh, affect the tone of this inquiry. Highly charged, as you say. Uh, she has been accused, hasn't she, over the last three days of wanting to protect the business, hide any negative issues, protect her own reputation as well. And there was some new and potentially very serious allegations put to her, removing any mention of the Horizon system from the prospectus. This was when the Royal Mail Group was sold off. Just explain that to us, Paul. Yes, yeah, so about until 2012, Royal Mail Group included the post office, the parent company. It was all publicly owned, ultimately, it was Royal Mail Group. Post Office was a subsidiary of that. Coalition government, one of its priorities was to sell off Royal Mail, to divide the companies. And that happened in 2013. And when you sell a company, you uh, list it on the stock market, you prepare a prospectus. And it includes not only all the great reasons somebody should consider buying shares, but also all the material risks. So that if you buy a share, you're aware of things that could affect it financially. Now, Turns out Paula Venels, who's running the post office, remember, intervened to have a mention of the Horizon IT system removed from the Royal Mail prospectus. Now, this mention was going to say there are no systemic failures, no evidence of them in the Horizon IT system. And that was the post office line throughout. But she knew at this time that there were bugs in the system. She admitted that. Uh, She knew that there was a potential for prosecutions to be reopened. And at the time that those prosecutions took place, it was the Royal Mail being sold off that was the prosecuting authority. It could decide whether to proceed with cases. So there was absolutely a potential blowback for Royal Mail, potentially for its shareholders. She accepted that. She was told it would be be destructive to the sell-off and she accepted it. Now, when she did it, got it hoiked out of the prospectus, she actually sent an email to her chairwoman um, at the time saying, I've earned my keep here which was unavoidable, her words, she accepted it. And the barrister put it to her that what you're actually doing there is you are suppressing, you are if you are keeping the lid on this so the government get this sale away. Now, she said that wasn't the case. She was uh, she didn't feel it was relevant. And the post office board at this time had already informed its insurers about the possibility of prosecutions being reopened. So they thought it was a material financial risk. Now, that's all very complicated, but it very starkly and undeniably puts her fingertips on a clear suppression of the bad news around Horizon. And that, barristers have said today, the postmasters have said for years, is at the heart of how Paula Venels ran the post office. She was more interested in the reputation than she was in the people who provided most of the profit and income. Yeah, the public image of the post office, perhaps more important to her than the fate of uh, all those sub-postmasters. And and you've watched closely over the last three days. She's very much been the focus. We know her reputation is in tatters. Do you think it's right that there's been so much focus on her? She's been on all the front pages. Is there a danger here of a a witch hunt against her when uh, others might also be culpable? I don't think so, actually. I think after overseeing this ruinous regime, she has to answer questions. Whether I'm sceptical about her evidence or think the contradictions in it, which I don't think anyone can deny, uh, uh, intentional or not, and the motivation isn't the point. What's impo- the point is this is a statutory true inquiry, and the entire point is that there is nowhere to hide for those involved at the time. Responsibility is another question, but this is one for, for media studies students, perhaps when we're running lectures in our dotage, uh, Jonathan, but the tactics she employed here of not speaking to the media for nine years. The last time she faced a question in public was 2015 in a parliamentary select committee. It's been the odd doorstep. Various organisations like ours have had a go, but she hasn't. In fact, she said today, I have not spoken to the media uh, deliberately, perhaps to my own detriment. And of course, that stores up the interest that exploded and and she faced when she had to struggle through an enormous media scrum. That is what happens when you don't speak. And I think it's quite right that she's here. In fact, she's used this appearance. She's had three days to put her case. And what more could anyone ask? Uh, And she's actually used it 
to spread the blame around pretty liberally. She's blamed people who worked for her. She's named four people today she believes didn't share enough information with her. They've all had the opportunity to give evidence. One of them isn't going to. The former general counsel, the lead lawyer, the post office, now lives in Australia and she is not returning to give evidence. People can draw their own conclusions. Uh, but I think it's been fair that she takes this. I think she's been treated fairly. The inquiry chair has done everything he can to remove hostility and she stands or falls by her own words. And just finally, uh, Paul, what happens now? Alan Bates has been meeting with the Met Police and also a, a, an historic day because the Post Office Offences Bill will receive royal assent. Yeah, it is remarkable, isn't it? We, uh, two strands there. Let's deal with the latter first. Post Office Offences Bill, at a stroke, when it gets royal assent, whenever that is, all the sub-postmasters out there who still haven't been cleared of their convictions, they're no longer guilty. They are they have a clean record. Now, some of them, they don't have to do anything. They don't have to fill in a form. Some of them, I know, would like some kind of confirmation. They want to know that criminal records count. You need to do background checks sometimes or travel to foreign countries that re require it. They would like to know it's taken off any IT systems and you can forgive them for being nervous, perhaps, about what's on uh, computer records. If they want compensation, they will have to satisfy the criteria but if they were convicted on the basis of horizon uh, they are in the clear and it, uh, to me it just shows here we are this uh, this inquiry was ongoing when the tv drama that pushed it to cause this bill effectively to happen because of public interest but doesn't it show if you have political will on all sides and you have you have the admission of wrongdoing finally out of the organization what can happen at a pet at the stroke of a pen they're in the clear they might wonder why this took uh, 15 years. And Paul, what about Alan Bates uh, and meeting the Met Police? Alan Bates started all this um, and he may well have, on purpose or not, set the hair running for what happens after this inquiry. While she, Paula Venables was giving evidence on the first day here, he spent his morning with the Metropolitan Police being filled in on their investigation, what they are doing by way of monitoring what's said here at the inquiry. And he didn't share too many details, but it's fair to say he was pretty bullish. And he said uh, his view is that they were taking it very, very seriously indeed. And that raises the prospect of potential criminal uh, actions following this inquiry. I would suggest to the Metropolitan Police, as the post office has found, if you don't meet Alan Bates's expectations, you will never hear the last of it. Paul, thanks very much. That was Paul Kelso, who uh, has been following the inquiry so closely over recent days. Uh, we are going to talk about the general election campaign in a minute, though, so don't go away. So day two of the general election campaign is it only day two. Goodness me. Uh, Rob Powell, our political correspondent, joins us now. A busy day today and energy very much on the agenda. The energy price cap has dropped. How beneficial is that going to be for Rishi Sunak? Look, I think it is to an extent, but it's important to say that this is the kind of backdrop against which the Tories are campaigning um, on. It, it does play into that kind of broader message that Rishi Sunak's trying to put across, though, that the country's kind of calming down, that stuff's getting back to normal. You know, we've started to turn a corner, inflation's come back down close to target. You know, we're starting to get a little bit of economic growth, and now energy bills are coming back down as well. Uh, the important point to say to that is that, yes, it, it may be coming down, but it's still a whole hell of a lot higher than it was three or four years ago. Um, and the second thing to say is that, is it really anything to do with what the government's done? Well, you know, they denied that they had really anything to do with energy prices spiking. They said that was about wholesale markets and international energy markets. So they can't really claim credit for them coming down now. And to be fair to them, they're not really trying to do that. Yeah. So we know the economy, of course, is going to play very heavily in this uh, election campaign. But what about energy costs and net zero specifically? Do you think they will be an electoral dividing line? What the Tories are trying to say is that because Sir Keir Starmer and Labour want to essentially decarbonise, move towards net zero, taking the use of oil and gas out of the system. Because well, they want to do that faster, then there is more of a risk that they have to pay for some of that stuff with taxation, which plays into the, the broader Conservative attack line that there's a big gaping hole in Labour's plans, which they need to spend money on, and they're going to do it like all Labour governments do, so they say, through tax rises. Labour saying, no, 
We've rode back from our £28 billion pledge. All of this is costed. Um, trust us, we, we can do this without spending too much taxpayer money. The way they'll do that is probably by trying to lean on the private sector and business to fund it. Mm, OK, so as I say, day two of the campaign, well, what are both leaders up to? Rishi Sunak has been visiting all four nations of the UK within 48 hours, uh, the first 48 hours of the campaign. Um, he was obviously in England, Scotland and Wales yesterday, and now he's flown over to Northern Ireland, Belfast. Bit of a weird choice in a way. There's no votes to be gained in Northern Ireland, obviously. They have separate parties over there. Um, even though you do have sort of Northern Irish Conservatives, no one votes for them and they often don't even really stand. So um, I think it, it's more the sort of optics of him going out to the whole of the United Kingdom and making these arguments. And we've seen him today doing uh, a pretty standard issue electioneering photo call in a marine manufacturer in Belfast doing things like sort of farting about on a, on a posh boat and <laughs> trying to, it's the technical term, trying to do something with some kind... I couldn't figure out what it was. I watched it a few times because I knew you were going to ask me this. Something to do with a kind of nut on a tube and he was doing something to do with that as well you know you know the usual thing where there's some sort of poor blighter in the factory that has just had their day completely blown apart by <laughs> saying that you're going to have to show the prime minister how, what you do every day so Keir Starmer has also been uh, out in the sort of devolved nations if you like he's been in Glasgow uh, and he's been doing that to try and trumpet an energy announcement he wants GB Energy which is the sort of state-owned um, energy company that would invest in renewables that Labour have promised to set up. That would be headquartered in Scotland. So um, he's been there doing a big campaign event, lots of placards with the word change emblazoned on it behind him, talking quite a lot, I thought, um, about uh, his new deal for workers, which is the sort of strengthening of union rights, strengthening of workers' rights. Something that I think in, with certain audiences, Labour audiences or Conservative audiences at the moment that Labour is trying to win over, could be off-putting. I think in Scotland to that audience, though, he wants to talk that up because he's sort of fighting on a different election battlefield, fighting against the um, SNP there and trying to steal SNP votes. Let's talk about the previous Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, he's announced that he's going to stand as an independent in Islington North. I mean, he was first elected, what, 40 years ago mm. or so? What, what's uh, Sir Keir's reaction been to that? quite sort of dismissive in a way actually he said look that's a that's a matter for Jeremy Corbyn I've been very clear that we're not letting him back into the party so what he does is up to him uh, interestingly he's now been expelled as a Labour member as well because whilst he actually had his membership restored which is the bit of uh, kind of your association with the Labour Party if you're an MP that is controlled by the party the leader hasn't really got anything to do with that the reason why he couldn't stand as an MP was because Keir Starmer wouldn't give him the whip back, so wouldn't let him be part of the parliamentary party. Now, because he's standing against Labour as an independent, he's been booted out of the party um, as well. Look, I was sort of in two minds about this. You know, the initial reaction, I guess, to it is thinking, oh, that, that that's not good for Labour, is it? They you know, potentially could lose it. He's a popular local candidate, and I think he's got a chance of, of winning that seat there against the Labour candidate. But equally, I, I think deep down they will not mind this happening because it is a chance for Labour to remind people how much the party has changed. And it's a chance for them to say, look, we've changed so much that the previous guy that was leading the party, we're not even letting him stand as a Labour MP now. Mm. He's going to—he's ha having to stand as an independent and fight against us. As we're talking about uh, candidates, just remind us how many MPs have, have stood down so far, because I think I'm right in saying for the Conservatives, it's getting close to a record number now, isn't it, in the run-up to an election? Yeah, we're at about 72, 73, I think, which is, I think we're in 97 territory in terms of how many are standing down. Um, ahead of this this election. The latest to go is Sir John Redwood, uh, MP for Wokingham um, in Berkshire. He's held that seat since about two months before I was born in 1987. Um, he was head of Margaret Thatcher's policy unit. You know, he was Welsh secretary. He uh, has been in the shadow cabinet. He's someone that was you know, heavily involved in Brexit in the Brexit debates as well. So uh, you know, he is a, a Tory veteran. Not, not too many reasons he's given why he, he's standing down. He simply said, well, I want to go and do other things. Uh, what might be playing on his mind is the Lib Dems have been pouring resource into that area um, and are quite confident at taking it, even though it's fairly far down their list of target seats. I think they were eyeing John Redwood um, as a sort of particularly juicy scalp to try and take. I wanted to ask you about TV debates as well, because Rishi Sunak says that he would like a TV debate once a week, which I'm not sure even the, even the viewers feel that they need. Um, but Sakir 
Keir was a little evasive this morning, wasn't he? I was watching him on Sky News when he was asked about this. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of, I think it's a bit of a phony war, the TV. It's a tradition of election campaigns that we spend at least like two or three days at the beginning of it having quite a sort of introspective navel-gazing conversation. (laughs) But it, it speaks to the fact that in this race, so Keir Starmer's got everything to lose and Rishi Sunak has got everything to gain. And TV debates can be those moments where something does shift. I mean, they, they can be quite dull as well, to be honest. I've sat through loads in the last couple of elections where you're trying to tease something out of it and because it, they just play it so safe, you don't get much from it. But, you know, you think back to the sort of I agree with Nick moment in 2010, which really uh, felt like a moment that the Lib Dems were really sort of Uh, in the ascendancy there. You think back to, I think, the Theresa May 2017, there's no magic money tree when she turned around to someone in the audience and said that. That felt like a moment as well. So the reason why they're argued over and that there's sort of tortuous negotiations that probably go on between uh, our bosses and the bosses in Labour as well about how how they play out is because they can achieve those moments. What's going to happen? Well, Labour sources say that Sir Keir Starmer, in terms of leaders' debates, sort of head-to-head type ones, is up for it, that he'll probably do them with the biggest audiences, though, in the biggest kind of, uh, sort of national news channels, which suggests it may be BBC ITV. But, um, you know, we asked Sir Keir Starmer about a leaders' event that Sky is hosting um, in Grimsby. He was pretty evasive about it, but he didn't say no. He mm. said, look, my advisors are talking about that. So I reckon we will get probably a mix of debates like we do most years um, around the same number, potentially. I think Labour will only do as many as they feel they really need to. Well, good luck, Rob, um, over the <laughs> next six weeks. Uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks very much. Thanks. And that's it for this episode of the Sky News Daily. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>